and there's a river flowing yeah <laughs> yeah okay uh, right uh, optimize for video and then when the video pops up hit the mute or the volume on the sky right here it should be there already but okay guys so we're good all right we're good we're good okay we should be live great so we got about two more minutes here to get going I can stop sharing if you want. For now. No, no, okay. no, no, we're just. Uh, no. We'll just give people a more, uh, couple more minutes to join in. Okay. And then there will also be people watching on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, and sure. if we get questions from them. We'll have some people put those in the chat for you. Sounds right. good. Okay. Sounds good. You're okay if I leave at this picture, or do you want me to yeah. shut it off? Yeah. All right, good. One more minute. All right, welcome to the MBTI. Thank you all for joining our webinar today. We have Dr. Sharma with us today and he will tell us about the Snow Leopard Trust. Please put any questions in the Q&A whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, are we good to start? You're all good, yeah, you're good to start. All right, excellent. Let me share, right. Can you just say yes if you see the snow leopard uh, covered in snow? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, uh, uh, Nat BioTeach in team, for inviting me to the first session uh, this year. I think this is my fourth year uh, of talking to the wonderful students connecting connected through this program. And I must admit uh, that I almost look forward to this event every year. Uh, why? It's because it allows me to review some of the interesting developments in the snow leopards world from the entire year, but uh, also because it allows me to connect to the future citizens of the world. Now, uh, having said that, please excuse me if you notice some visuals and information that are repeating from previous year's talks. There's only that much uh, we can learn every year about the mighty elusive snow leopards. So there could be overlaps to make it all come together, but uh, this time I'm going to focus a little more on climate change, one of the hottest topics uh, on our planet, of course, pun intended. I'll share with you how it's affecting uh, snow leopards, us and everything around us. Okay, now we know the earth is warming and it is warming pretty fast. To those uh, who think it's a hoax or just a natural phenomena, this very intriguing visualization says it all in just a few seconds. Um, as you can see here, we just passed the, uh, the beginning of the industrial revolution and this is how temperatures have changed in a little more than 100 years. And as we get closer to the year 2000, it starts getting more and more evident and uh, dramatic. That's still 20 years ago. And you can already see we are in the red zone. That's 10 years ago, we're still in the red zone. And that's how it was until a year ago. Now, that's how much, how dramatically, if you look at it this way, that's how dramatically things have changed. We've already 
warmed a planet by about a degree uh, since the, let's say, 1800s, which is when the Industrial Revolution had started. Now, there's another intriguing visualization. Again, this is done by NASA, uh, which, uh, which shows how things are changing regionally across the planet. Uh, if you look carefully, the white color here denotes normal temperatures. Higher than normal temperatures are shown in red and lower than normal temperatures are shown in blue. Uh, normal, normalcy is calculated over a 30 year baseline period of 1951 and 1980. Now, what you see is in the last five years, you will see uh, the last frame will show you what happened in the last five years. And that's where we are. You can see not a little bit, but quite a lot of warming everywhere. Now, while these graphs tell us what's uh, that the Earth is warming up uh, around us, it does not really tell us what it means to us. Most people tend to believe that a colder winter day or a warmer summer night is all climate change is going to do. Now, this intriguing visualization yet again by NASA shows how just one of the elements that are so crucial to our lives, which is food production, is going to dramatically change. And this is predicting into the future. Uh, it is estimated that the average crop yields for maize or corn that you, uh, that you uh, consume may see a decline of literally a, a fourth of its current production by the end of this century, uh, assuming the current trends continue. Now, in contrast, in some areas, crop yields uh, will increase. Uh, for instance, with wheat, it will increase in a few areas, but not as much. They'll increase by about, let's say, 15, 20 percent uh, or so on. Now, these, these changes are going to cause uh, radical shifts in economies. They're going to cause, uh, they're going to be a result of dramatic shifts in rainfall patterns and ele elevated surface carbon dioxide concentrations uh, due to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Talking locally, climate change will lead to a mixed bag of impacts. Temperature, rain, snow, and cold regimes will become more and more unpredictable. And given how much we depend on uh, some sort of a pattern in the, in the, weather, in the, in the weather across the year, uh, it is going to be a, a massive uh, gambling going forward into what you want to sow, what you want to harvest, when you want to do it, how much you want to invest, how much you want to diversify. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from this small country here, which is uh, called the Kyrgyz Republic. It's in Central Asia. Uh, plus six time uh, GMT is the time zone, so you can get an idea. Well, to get, give you a better idea, over there it must be 8 a.m. and over here it is 8 p.m. So I'm literally uh, on the other polar end of where you guys are. Now, I'm going to show you a few satellite images from just within Kyrgyzstan uh, to showcase what's happening in the mountains. Now, we all know glaciers are important. They are the source of, uh, of, source of many, many rivers which provide water uh, and life to people living downstream. And we are seeing retreating glaciers. And if you see these two images, these are, this is August 94 and this is September 21. You see a dramatic shrinking in the glaciers within uh, the last uh, a few years. Uh, now there's another, this is a big reservoir in the country which provides electricity. Now to, for a country which depends largely on hydropower, uh, if your main source of hydropower shrinks, you're going to have energy issues. And that's exactly where the country is already headed. The, this big reservoir has shrunk quite dramatically. Uh, and uh, that's only within a, about five years time, as you see here. And that's another dramatic change we are seeing here. So what these changes will do is they will yield greater stress on the human populations, especially to the poor and the vulnerable sections that live in these remote mountains and depend on a very, very limited uh, amount of resources. 
Uh, now, this is another intriguing visual that you will see here. It's got a bit of an audio. Let me try and pause the audio if I can. Well, let it go. Yeah, this is a glacier which is melting for the first time in millennia. And it's not going to leave things around them unaffected. I imagine this is like the whole ground under you is moving. There's a little house out there, the herder's house. And that house did get carried away, did get uh, washed away in this slow moving glacial uh, avalanche, as one may call it. Uh, we are already seeing an increase in extreme temperatures, such as flash floods, zoods, um, which is extreme winter across the range. Uh, be it on the left side, Pakistan's Chitral, or on the right side, you can see uh, Mongolia's Gobi. Now, climate change is certainly going to, is causing and going to cause greater losses to lives and livelihoods. So I'll slowly shift gears towards snow leopards, but let me just finish this broader introduction and how this all affects um, the snow leopards. Let's first review what is causing climate change. Now, the data visualizations featured on this page present a very high level summary of uh, the contributions uh, of human versus natural drivers of climate change. Uh, the animation showcases distinct drivers. If you see carefully the green line uh, that's moving, that's the natural driver. The red line is the human induced driver. Uh, human and natural put together is the blue line uh, for each data set. And on the right hand side, you can see the Arctic ice uh, area anomaly. So if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that the green has remained more or less constant. There's not much that the green has changed. It's the red one and the blue ones which are dramatically changing, clearly indicating that it's us who are causing it than uh, it being a natural phenomena. And as uh, human-induced factors are leading to these, uh, this uh, catastrophe around us, here is a rough breakdown of various sectors that are contributing to climate change. Um, largely carbon dioxide, as you can see, the big yellow bubble. But under that, you can see various sectors, industry sectors, which are contributing. Transportation is a massive, massive contributor, followed by energy generation, electricity, industry, agriculture, <laughs> and ultimately residential as well. Now, another interesting map here where you can see that the warmer colors represent those countries that are mainly responsible for this catastrophic buildup of greenhouse gases, uh, which are in turn leading to temperature anomalies across the planet. Um, Clearly, there are few leading uh, countries over here contributing the most. Now, compare that to the risk being faced by countries. You will see the major sufferers of uh, climate change are those countries, uh, which are the uh, quotes unquote typically uh, uh, called as the global south, those who are uh, developing or underdeveloped at this point in time. It's those countries who are destined to face the consequences like no other. Uh, to give you a slightly more uh, high resolution uh, of, uh, of what's happening, of the difference in the impact, the, uh, the two colors you see on top, uh, they represent the United States and Russia, and the one little black line below represents Kyrgyzstan. You can clearly see the contribution of greenhouse gases uh, as compared between these two countries. So what does that mean? I mean, yes, it does. I mean, we should not forget that uh, even if your impact is small, you know, every light bulb you switch off, every bottle you recycle, every paper you save from printing, it does accumulate to the global contributions towards minimizing carbon climate emissions. But being pragmatic, we also are looking at, a, at a scenarios where we are destined to face havoc and uh, much more havoc to be caused in those countries that have little to contribute towards it. So what can these countries do about it? They, can, they need to adapt. And uh, adaptation is nothing but bracing for impact so you can minimize the damage when the impact takes place. Uh, climate change 
adaptation in simple words as being prepared for climate change. Uh, it may include diversifying your livelihood options. It may include uh, using data inform and information to minimize the unpredictability of weather patterns. Uh, it includes uh, reducing our di direct dependence on ecosystem uh, or, or on, uh, on nature-based services uh, that are likely to be badly impact impacted. Now, there's no single formula of what you should do uh, to adapt, but generally speaking, you need to make sure that you don't keep all your eggs in one basket. And that has been one of the most, uh, uh, most effective strategies so far uh, for climate adaptation. Okay, so sorry for that very long doom and gloom uh, scenario. Uh, I'm going to quickly change gears a little bit. And I believe you must all have heard about the snow leopard. Uh, I wonder if any of you has ever seen in person, uh, but do not beat yourself uh, or do not worry if you haven't seen one, because if you look at this image right in front of you, uh, you see that there's a, there's a goat on the lower left corner. It's a wild goat. We call it ibex. No, no, ibex is one of the main foods, uh, one of the main prey species of the snow leopard. Now, for this ibex, it life, its life depends on its ability to spot the snow leopard so that it can escape in time. But this one ibex has absolutely no clue where the snow leopard is. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide to show you where actually the snow leopard is. And by the way, if you have noticed, if you have spotted the snow leopard, give, give yourself a pat on the back or put a comment in the window, uh, in, in the chat window. And uh, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll call your name out. But that's where the snow leopard is. It clearly has an uncanny ability to melt in the backdrop. And that's why snow leopards are also known as the ghost of the mountain. Here's another picture of the ghost before moving on. Uh, if any of you can spot the snow leopard, let me know again in the chat window. Or, uh, and then, of course, I'd love to call your name. But if you zoom into this one, there it is. You zoom in a little bit, and there you start seeing the uh, outline of this cat, which is literally uh, in unison with the uh, with the mountains behind it. Now, the snow leopard thrives in what uh, is known as one of the most hostile and treacherous mountains uh, in the world. Uh, it is almost custom designed by evolution to survive in these vertical mountains with thin oxygen and extreme temperatures. Um, no wonder people even call it an evolutionary marvel. Now, uh, just to talk a little more about this, a publication came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it investigated not the whole anatomy, but just the forelimb of a snow leopard. And it, uh, it found out how nicely uh, there are functional adaptations that balance demands of a head first descent, as you are seeing right now, pouncing, climbing across rocky terrain, restraining uh, large prey, making rapid pursuits, and also navigating deep snow with almost snowsho uh, snowshoe-like uh, uh, like, uh, feet. Now, you know, the parts in the body, be it like the bony clavicle, they're providing greater stability to the forelimb, or there's a compromise that's there in the brachium and the antibrachium of the powerful grip to grasp large prey without compromising on the stability in rapid pursuit. Now, the, 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 I mean, the paper is a fascinating read. Uh, there are a couple of Twitter threads about it as well. You must look it up if you would like to know more about it, but it's really, it just highlights how uh, how well adapted the snow leopard is to live in these incredible mountains. And that's exactly why it's not a surprise that snow leopards are also hunting machines. Now, what you're seeing here are the movement patterns of just one snow leopard, the red dot moving around in the map. That's uh, These are real locations of a snow leopard. Those ibex popping up are real ibex, which are not alive, but they've been uh, slayed by this one snow leopard. And the reason this one snow leopard is even more special is because uh, it's one of my favorites. 
uh, for and it has just one eye. Uh, she she was injured a few months after we started following her with the uh, GPS collar, but she has continued to be an ace ibex slayer. Her hunting prowess is like a testimony to the incredible adaptation of snow leopards uh, to thrive in 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 these incredible mountains. By the way, the the graph you see below moving slowly that's uh, uh, how far it's moving from the previous location. So when it stops moving a lot from the previous location, that's when we start anticipating. We predict that they could be a kill. We send our team who later find out what the uh, what was the animal that the snow leopard may have killed. So that's how we kind of uh, uh, do some sorts of investigation into what snow leopards are eating. Now, the snow leopard is, of course, uh, a species that uh, is a habitat specialist living just above the tree line and below the altitude where there are permanent glaciers. Now, you all know about the North Pole, which is uh, right up in the north. You all know the South Pole, which is where you have the penguins. Um, now, the, these apart from these two poles, our planet also has a third pole. And the third pole is this region, which we also know as the Snow Leopard Range. Uh, now, this region stores roughly 7,000 trillion liters of the planet's fresh water. The Snow Leopard represents uh, this precious reserve of water that plays several roles in addition to, of course, providing water. Uh, it provides sec carbon sequestration services. It uh, deter helps determine uh, or, or even control weather patterns across many countries uh, that have eventually flourished uh, with human civilization. Now, even, if, even though it is found um, in one continent, the snow leopard is uh, distributed across uh, 12 countries. And if I try to show you these countries, yeah, there we are, starting from Russia, Mongolia, China, Bhutan, all the way till Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan being its westernmost uh, range. This is where the snow leopards are found. So you can see it's a it's a very nice overlap with the third pole uh, of our planet Earth. Now, how many are there is what typically people ask. We don't have a very good answer yet. Hopefully by the end of this year, uh, we would have completed um, a range-wide survey, a collaborative survey, which we call as PAWS, which stands for Population Assessment of the World's Snow Leopards. But uh, there is a guesstimate that there could be as few as three and a half thousand snow leopards uh, in the wild. Now, just to give you a perspective, uh, imagine a snow leopard is a grain of rice. And if you take all the entire world's snow leopards, they'll all fit into half, a, half of this ordinary cup that you might have at homes or in school. Now, if you compare that to the human population, it is going to, um, where is, yeah, let's assume that each grain of rice is a human. When we make that assumption, we're gonna need 700,000 cups to fill up the Earth's human population. So half a cup of, a snow, of snow leopards versus 700,000 cups of humans. That's how uh, rare and that's how uh, sparsely uh, populated snow leopards are. People often ask, why are there so few of them? Well, it's humans. Uh, all threats faced by snow leopards today are human induced. And these include illegal wildlife trade, which is driven by the desire for wearing or gifting something exotic. Um, it's also driven by a poor herder who might be avenging the loss of his or her livelihood uh, by killing uh, livestock. Um, the populations are uh, restricted or constrained because of mismanaged overhunting of wildlife. Uh, which, of course, serves as snow leopard food. So if there's not enough food, the snow leopard populations get um, artificially um, uh, restrained as well. Uh, some of these things were not even considered uh, as threats about 15 years ago. For instance, poorly planned infrastructure. Uh, currently, it's one of the biggest threats uh, 
pacing the snow leopard distribu- uh, snow leopard range uh, 15 years ago we didn't even consider it to be a threat but roads and big dams and mines are coming into snow leopard habitat uh, again we all need them i'm not saying don't have them just plan them better so that they ca- cause the minimum damage to the snow leopard habitat and they also make sure that uh, there are enough mitigation measures that can ensure uh, that uh, the roads remain safe for both humans as well as wildlife and of course the mother of all threats climate change uh, and the reason why we call climate change as the mother of all threats is because it's uh, it's not going to directly impact snow leopards as much uh, as it is going to impact humans uh, in fact uh, what it will do is if you re- if you just uh, if you remember the other threats i mentioned each of those threats is going to be uh, severely uh, inter- uh, each of those threats is going is going to be severely affected by climate change in other words climate change is going to interact with every other threat the snow leopards are already facing making it worse by a variable degree um, so i'll come back to this a little uh, later but uh, before that i'd like to highlight another challenge which we just realized as recently as a couple of years ago um, you know as if the current list of threats was not enough uh, a recent policy advisory uh, that our teams released it reports that the mountains of central and south asia are far more vulnerable uh, to inf- emerging infectious diseases as as compared to southeast asia and uh, the african continent and one of the simpler reasons is because this region has uh, has such a poor history such a uh, uh, such a uh, scant history of dealing with infectious diseases that it's crossly under uh, under prepared uh, and then if you com- if you kind of uh, uh, overlay it with uh, other things that are happening we know glaciers are, me- are melting at unprecedented rates we just saw some images earlier now imagine these glaciers have remained frozen for millennia and uh, when they melt they're going to bring down um, pathogens be it bacteria or viruses or other fungal uh, uh, uh life which is going to uh, which at least we are not going to be prepared with none of the life uh, none of the people none of the animals none of the wildlife living in this area as is going to be prepared for them and as people get pushed closer to remote areas due to unpredictable and rapidly changing weather conditions uh because of uh, climate change it's going to lead to more conflict between snow leopards and people and that if you think about uh, poorly planned linear infrastructure it's going to drive up poaching illegal wildlife trade and direct mortality because of habitat fragmentation and collisions on roads so what we are really looking at is a, is a convergence of infectious diseases with linear infrastructure uh in in one of the once uh, inaccessible habitats illegal wildlife trade and climate change now these are all coming together creating a sort of a nexus uh which is a, a, a much bigger threat than individually uh, each of these would have been and uh, the most critical factor here is that these threats do not affect snow leopards or biodiversity only they have a cascading impact on us our well-being and our livelihoods as well and to highlight that or to exemplify that i'm just going to give you a small example uh, about this beautiful little girl kaniki uh, she lives with her family in the tian shan mountains uh, uh, in in the remote part of kyrgyzstan and a family makes a small income of just about 2 and a half thousand dollars per year uh, but uh, for that small income of 2 and 1/2000 dollars a year what if i tell you that kaniki and her family also receives ecosystem services such as water fodder fuel and several other commodities uh, whose market value as per local market rates 
is worth twenty thousand dollars, or uh, say sixteen to twenty thousand dollars, almost eight to ten times uh, the family's annual average income, and they get all of this free of cost. Now, where do they get this from? Um, if I can give you a quick example here, uh, we know the third pole. We just discussed the glaciers of the third pole. Uh, and that it has uh, trillions of liters of water. Uh, the third pole is home to 14 of the world's highest peaks and more than 100,000 square kilometers of glaciers. Uh, it is no wonder that it has given birth to several rivers uh, that have mothered some of the richest of the world's civilizations for, for uh, thousands and thousands of years. And uh, as, we, uh, as we see it, it's a, it is this region, uh, the third pole, which is uh, which is anticipated to be which not anticipated. It's already warming at twice the rate than the rest of the planet. Uh, and also very interestingly, uh, you know, uh, the red patch here, the red color patch you see here, this is where snow leopards are distributed, uh, as we know. Uh, and if you look carefully, the gray. Uh, lines or the gray shades, these are areas within 100 kilometers uh, from international borders. And if you look carefully, almost a third of the world's snow leopard population is within 100 kilometers of uh, international borders. Uh, what it does is it makes the snow leopard um, an ambassador of the mountains. Uh, obviously, it doesn't need any passports or visas to cross these borders. And we do know from research that it does cross these international borders uh, regularly, as long as they're not fenced. And that uh, is one uh, aspect about a snow leopard that makes it the ambassador of the third pole. Uh, it makes it an ambassador of transboundary cooperation. And it also makes it an ambassador of climate impact on regions which are outside the, the polar caps of the planet. Uh, and the reason we uh, we need to be uh, aware of how it's going, the climate change is going to impact snow leopards is uh, is something simple. We know that snow leopards live, and this is something we know based on data, research data, is that they survive between minus forty degrees Celsius and plus forty degrees Celsius uh, across its range. So. It, it clearly shows that it may not be as sensitive as coral reefs and will survive temperature variation over the short term of a couple of degrees. But it is not going to be able to survive uh, when, uh, or, or let me put it in other words, what will affect uh, a snow leopard severely is how humans respond uh, to these induced uh, changes uh, in the form of extreme events, forced changes in livelihood options. Uh, and then that will result in more human wildlife interaction, uh, more conflict between humans and wildlife, and hence much lower acceptance of wildlife and negative interactions um, at the same time. So if, uh, yeah, as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the threats faced by snow leopards and its ecosystem uh, across the range are going to interact with climate change, uh, making them much more complex and much more uh, amplified. And hence, we call it the mother of all threats. So um, incidentally, the, the, I mean, yes, things are, things are uh, in a precarious situation, but what do we do about it? So the best way to, to conserve snow leopards is by partnering with people. And uh, that's where that's what we do. People often ask some I wouldn't say often, but sometimes people some people ask that, oh, why should we invest in snow leopard conservation where there is so much of there's so many other issues that we should be uh, concerned about? The answer is not a single penny that goes to snow leopard conservation goes to the snow leopard's pocket. It goes to the people who are proudly, despite all the trouble, despite all the uh, pain, sharing their spaces with this mighty cat. Uh, so partnership with the primary stakeholders, which, are, which is the local communities, allows them to be at the forefront of conservation initiatives and hence provides them the ownership 
over uh, over the initiatives that you may undertake uh, to conserve this uh, stunning species. Now, there could be anything, you know, whether it is beekeeping, cheese production, cashmere production, or even uh, uh, even ethically and sustainably done tourism. As long as economic development is looked in a way that it can diversify the source of livelihood without really damaging the snow leopard habitat, these initiatives, um, uh, you know, can can be part or can be called as uh, climate adaptation. Because uh, if you are diversifying these uh, programs, if you're making sure that if one fails, there is something else which is going to uh, sustain the communities, reduce their hardships, there is a greater chance uh, that they will be more tolerant to the presence of the snow leopard. Uh, there will be uh, fewer impacts that the snow leopard populations will face because of uh, the changing patterns of space use by people. And of course, lest I forget to mention, education and awareness must go hand in hand with any of these initiatives, uh, whether it's research, you know, scientists do their research, but that research is of no value unless it is shared with politicians, unless it's shared with uh, citizens, unless it's shared with all the people living across the world, uh, because uh, ultimately, it is that conservation connection that needs to be made. It is that uh, value of uh, all these actions that needs to be communicated. Uh, and uh, so much so, just to give you one more example, uh, you know, talking about convergences and connectivity, uh, a snow leopard conservation program, if it is done in partnership with people, um, it uh, it can address anywhere between 10 to 13 of the 17 uh, United, uh, sustainable development goals that the United Nations has uh, identified towards uh, achieving the uh, the global biodiversity target for 2030, and uh, not just uh, not just uh, the sustainable development goals these uh, conservation programs also align with the Paris Climate Agreement as much as do align, they align with the Aichi biodiversity targets, which are uh, also uh, being championed. So yeah, with that uh, slightly longish chat, I'd like to stop here. And uh, please feel free to let us know if you have any questions or suggestions. I'm going to, going to change the mode a bit and then hold on uh, right okay i see uh if right, you, you do have some time um, yeah go ahead under the question all right i'll just go ahead to the questions now uh, question one is by shana uh, shana is asking are snow leopards forced to migrate due to climate change Eventually, yes. Uh, there definitely are changes in their movement patterns that are that are being observed. We can't say for sure whether it's just because of climate change changing the temperature and climate uh, and the weather patterns, or is it because of how people are changing the way they use habitat because of climate change? But definitely, when 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 the space use of uh, of some of people changes, it is definitely affecting uh, species such as snow leopards who are probably going to have to either move up in some areas, they might even need to move slightly down in other areas. And uh, at the same time, there could be other bigger predators which might be moving closer to them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a mishmash of uh, how things are going to get affected, but definitely so it is going to be affected. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee who asks, what is your favorite fun fact about snow leopards? Um, oh, yes, my fun fact. I mean, you all, uh, you know, your teachers and moms uh, must know how difficult it is to take care of, uh, uh, of kids, to, to, to train them into becoming better 
successful human uh, human beings and citizens uh, now of all the cats that we know the snow leopard mom is the most devoted uh, teacher slash mother because they take care of their cubs for the longest period of time, almost 18, 20 months uh, in total, which is more uh, than even tigers and lions, which are much bigger in size. So to me, that's a very fun fact that, you know, snow leopard moms are cool moms and cool teachers. Uh, they spend a lot of time helping their cubs grow into successful uh, cats. Uh, we have Miss Lucas uh, Glenbrook from fifth grade. Uh, she's asking, is it just our end seeing the black box covering the text? Oops, I'm sorry. Was there a black box covering the text? I'm really sorry. If it was, I will be happy to. You're uh, all good now. It's all good. Ah, uh, okay. You're good. I'm glad. Thank you. All right. Um, Ale Alejandra Flores is asking, what affects the population growth of snow leopards? So starting from, you know, if you look at it this way, what does a snow leopard need? Think about yourself. Think about you being a snow leopard. What do you need? You'll need to make sure you have food. You'll need to make sure you have a place to rest without getting worried about someone uh, like a wolf or uh, uh, a hunter or a poacher coming and uh, taking you away, right? Or, or uh, hurting you. And if these two things are, are taken care of, then you have all the reasons for, your, for the young ones to grow and disperse. So uh, snow leopard's population growth does, uh, does get positively affected if there is space and if there is an opportunity for them uh, to, to breed and to grow. If not, then they're in a bit of a trouble. And that's, and if, the, if someone is taking away their food, you know, illegal hunting is going on and that's reducing their prey, then it affects snow leopard's population as well. If someone's uh, making a road right in between a snow leopard habitat, then the snow leopards on the right cannot go to the left. Then you have separated the two populations and then that affects their growth as well. So there are many of the threats that I mentioned earlier. These are what affect the population growth of snow leopards. Okay, so I have answered that live. Let me quickly go through the other ones. Fun fact. Mm. Okay, this is also done. Uh, Aiden is asking, uh, how fast are snow leopards? Um, they, I mean, they're certainly not as fast as a cheetah, but I can easily say that they're among the fastest animals in these mountains. Imagine running in a mountain which is like this. Uh, I can separately, I haven't shown it today, but I can separately send you all a link to uh, to, to an incredible video where a snow leopard is out hunting. You will see how fast it runs and how difficult a landscape does it, uh, does it hunt in. And also just to uh, highlight the fact that snow leopards do not run for long distance uh, chasing their prey. They, they, uh, they rely on surprise. Uh, so they can take very fast short uh, sprints uh, often these are you know they're uh, trying to uh, catch their prey in these shorter bouts and they really need a place to hide from where they can get close to the prey that they want to hunt uh, adrian is asking how strong are snow leopards hmm, how do i say how strong are snow leopards? let me put it this way very strong uh, for an animal to be able to hunt an, a prey which is, let's say, twice its size or three, sometimes even three times its, its weight, you need to be super duper strong, right? I don't know if you have uh, seen, but if you see the movie Kung Fu Panda 1, uh, you, will know, you will see that there is a, there's a villain in the film called uh, Tai Lung. 
Now, Pylong is super duper strong. Of course, it's slightly exaggerated because it's an animation and it's a, it's a fun film, but uh, there must have been a reason why they chose a, a snow leopard as a super strong uh, creature who is, uh, who everyone was scared of. Um, Jody is asking me, asking a question, just wondering, what else snow leopards eat? So snow leopards primarily eat uh, the wild goats and the wild sheep. Um, I mentioned ibex. There are other she wild sheep called argali, Marco Polo sheep. Then there is something called a blue sheep, which is actually a false, uh, it's a pseudo sheep. Um, in some countries, uh, there's another beautiful animal called the markor which is a big goat with very nice spiral horns. Uh, in some areas, even musk deer. Uh, and in some areas, they eat uh, marmots, the small marmots, when they come out uh, during the summer after their hibernation. And uh, they also eat livestock uh, whenever. It's like, livestock is like fast food for them. It's very easy to access, but it's also bad for health, right? Just like fast food. You know, you can go and eat a lot of fast food very easily. It's not expensive. Just go get it, but then it's not good for your body. Similarly, uh, killing livestock might be easy at times, but then it can also make the herder very upset, and then the herder can uh, hurt the snow leopard. So that's uh, that's typically uh, the range of things snow leopards eat, the animals that snow leopards eat. How do snow leopards raise their young? Now, that's a lovely question, Shanna. So snow leopards are, um, you know, have you seen a cat raising their cubs, uh, their little uh, kittens? Almost the same way. They give birth in a den, usually in a den, which is nicely, uh, you know, they believe it must be protected. So they, they give birth to their uh, cubs in a den. The eyes are closed for, I think, Think. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember right now, but maybe about three weeks or so. Their eyes are shut and uh, slowly their eyes open. And then the mom, if she senses anybody has come around or you know there's a possible danger to the cubs, she carries them literally uh, like the domestic cats do by grabbing the back of the neck and moving them to another den. And then as the cubs start walking a little bit, they start following their moms. Uh, but they're very obedient uh, kids. They have to listen to mom, otherwise it's danger to their life. And when they start following their mom, they start, uh, the moms start uh, in a way teaching them, right? The mom has to go and hunt. And as the cubs go bigger, the mom has to hunt many times more often. Uh, and while the mom is hunting, the cubs try to help sometimes, or they try to make their own kills. But the cubs will keep failing uh, because they don't have the skills that the mom has. So they keep coming back to mom for the food. And uh, ultimately, it's practice that makes a cub perfect. So when the cubs learn over a lot of, of time and practice how to be a successful snow leopard making kills, uh, that's when this they are sort of ready to uh, go away. But then who, who, who doesn't like free lunches? And uh, just around the time of February or so, which is roughly now, this is the time when uh, snow leopards mate. And if the cubs are big enough, this is the time they they move away uh, so that the, uh, the female is ready to have cubs again. And a new, uh, new set of siblings is, uh, is uh, there to populate the population. We have an anonymous attendee asking what would be a snow leopard's ideal habitat? An ideal habitat for a snow leopard, again, very good question. Uh, an ideal habitat would be an area with uh, enough wild prey. Um, an ideal habitat would be one where there are human populations which are not suffering because of um, uh, you know, snow leopards ending up killing their livestock. So they will have uh, protected livestock uh, corrals. They would be herding the livestock better and making sure that snow leopards uh, don't kill their livestock. There'll be enough wild prey for snow leopards and there'll be enough uh, ruggedness in the terrain. In, in, in other words, uh, 
the terrain will be will have enough rocks and boulders and opportunities for a snow leopard to hunt uh, successfully. If you leave a snow leopard in a football ground, it'll not be able to hunt because it it wouldn't have the skill to be able to hide, and it's able to hide because that's how it manages to hunt. And if it can't hide, it may not be able to make a good hunt. So these are a few factors that can make uh, an ideal snow leopard habitat. Uh, we have one more question from Alejandra. Again, how can snow leopards and humans coexist? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, they have always lived together, right? They've lived in the same area. Uh, when you have snow leopards living in the same area as people, there will be chances, there will be opportunities, there will be occasions when a snow leopard might uh, kill a livestock or it might hurt uh, a few uh, sheep or goat that the person may have. So to make sure that they coexist, we need to make, ensure that we are uh, we're working closely with the people who are sharing this space with snow leopards and ensure that uh, they either are able to predator proof the places where their livestock are or have programs which make sure that even if they lose their livestock once in a while, they are able to uh, bear that loss either through collective sharing of losses or through other programs that help improve their livelihoods. I think these are some of the ways snow leopards and humans can possibly coexist. Um, another anonymous attendee is asking, does climate change affect how snow leopards raise their young? Well, if it affects how snow leopards are getting uh, to move about or how they uh, are getting affected, they definitely, it is definitely affecting how the snow leopards uh, young get raised. More humans, less space to, uh, or, or more people closer, more livestock closer to snow leopard dens will make it difficult for them to raise their young the way they would otherwise be able to. Okay, uh, we have a question from Adrian, uh, who's wondering, besides humans, do snow leopards have any predators? <clears throat> so snow leopards and wolves have overlapping ranges. Um, and uh, if there are you know, many wolves in good number, they can be a predator for snow leopards. And vice versa, if a, if a snow leopard is in a good position, it can also kill a, a wolf. So I think that's uh, possibly one of the apex predators in that altitude. Having said that, there are some countries, there are some places actually in Bhutan and parts of India, uh, they have recorded snow leopards and tigers in the same area. Uh, so yes, if a, if a tiger finds a snow leopard, it is going to be able to um, kill a snow leopard as well. Uh, how thick is a snow leopard coat? I wouldn't remember the uh, exact, because it's, it's variable, right? This, uh, the coat is different on the underside. It's different on the, uh, in the back and it's different on the tail. But I can, I can find out these exact specifications and get those emailed to you uh, from literature. I don't remember on top of my head how, what exactly is, uh, how thick, its fur is. Uh, okay, oh, where are we? Coexist is done. This is done. Um, how long does an ab uh, does the average snow leopard live? Um, Aiden is asking. Now again, a very good question. So in captivity, snow leopards live longer. When they are in zoos, they can live up to 16 years. I think there was an incident. Uh, there was one individual which lived up to 20, 22 years. But in the wild, on an average, we expect, uh, we, we, we believe, based on data, that they live around uh, 10 to 12 years. That's typically their average lifespan in the wild. Um, Eliana would like to know how snow leopards find their prey. Oh, they patrol the area all the time. They're patrolling and patrolling and patrolling. They have home ranges, which could be um, maybe twice or thrice the size of, uh, well, actually, let's say, yeah, roughly the size of entire Manhattan, 
right? No, three times the size of Manhattan. That's how big a snow leopard's range typically is. And uh, so they need to patrol it all the time. And when they're patrolling the area, they might spot a snow, a spot prey from a distance uh, and uh, then do the other maneuvers. You know, there's a very, some very interesting observations uh, people have had that before making, before preparing to make a hunt, the roll on the on their back, which is also which also helps them uh, acquire the color of the soil and makes them more invisible than they already are. So typically they they use eyesight, they use uh, certain kind of habitats, and they keep patrolling to find prey as and when they can make a kill. Adrian's question now is how big snow leopards are. Right. So a snow leopard could be, a, a, if you want to know by weight, and I only know metric system. So they're about uh, 35 to 45 kilos in weight. Uh, in terms of length, the body could be about one meter long and the tail could be another meter long. So for an adult, the body is as long as the tail. And that's how big uh, snow leopards typically are. Um, Shana, again, uh, are people hunting snow leopards more because they're moving into human settlements due to snow leopards being put? Yes, possibly. That could be one of the reasons. In some areas, yes, it is happening. In some areas, uh, people are more, slightly more tolerant because some conservation organization or the government or others are working and making sure there is not much of a, an overlap. I think we have four more minutes uh, before... We finish or we have a few more questions. <laughs> What's the closest you've been to a snow leopard? Thanks for asking this question. Um, how do I say? Okay, I'll go back a bit that far. I was here and there was a snow leopard right here. It just jumped up a ledge and it found me standing there. And we were both surprised. Probably the snow leopard was more surprised than I was. And it looked at me with big eyes, turned around and just ran away saying, I don't want to be close to a human. Um, how many babies do snow leopard have? So snow leopards can have anywhere between, between one to four cubs. I think I'm not 100% sure, but there has been one inc instance where they, someone reported four, five cubs, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But yeah, between one and four cups is uh, typically uh, what you see them with. Um, how do you think the population of snow leopards will change over the next 10 years? Well, if you grow into a responsible citizen and you make sure that your family, your friends do not invest in businesses that are detrimental to snow leopards, you make sure that you or your family and friends do not buy snow leopard skin or any other product which is hurting snow leopards. Um, and if that happens, then I'm very hopeful that uh, the snow leopard populations will continue to get better. Um, there's a lot of awareness now than there was earlier. Today's children are far more aware, far more. Uh, sensitive to what's happening around the world. So I'm, I'm actually very hopeful because of you guys. Um, we and the generations before us, we were pretty, pretty bad. So you guys, I'm very hopeful with. Um, how do snow leopards get their color? Mm, well, the, the born with it, right? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I understand the question, but please feel free to write further if you would like more clarification on that question. Um, is there a common medical treatment performed on snow leopards? No, we try not to disturb or uh, trouble them uh, or interfere with, uh, with their life in the wild. Uh, if, if a snow leopard is injured, it's a better fate for it uh, to be replaced by a fitter individual than take it into captivity and increase its misery. Uh, so that's what I think I've already answered the answer, uh, a question about lifespan. We don't really know if the lifespan has changed over the years. Uh, we only have one point in uh, uh, time, uh, uh, you know, one study which has, uh, which, oh, 
we don't know whether things have changed over the uh, years about its lifespan. How high do snow leopards jump? That's Arjun. Um, so Arjun, I'm going to send you a video. You have a look and you see how high, both ways, upward and downwards, snow leopard jump. One of the biggest jumps I've ever seen was a few hundred meters downward. You'll see the video and, and that will give you an idea how, how, how high or low can snow leopards jump. Isaac uh, would like to know if snow leopards eat fish. We don't know. We've never seen one. Uh, Janessa is wondering how scientists safely capture the snow leopards to put the GPS collars on them. A very nice question. So we, we have experts in our team who, uh, who first think how a snow leopard walks and where would it, a snow leopard walk. Then they put cat safe snares, which are like... Uh, uh, when a snow leopard puts a foot in it, it gets caught in that. The moment a snow leopard gets caught in the snare, it sends a radio signal to the cab where these experts are either sleeping or working. And then within a few minutes, they pack, they have their bags and all the gear. They get to the snow leopard, they stand at a safe distance and put a remote injection uh, with the uh, with the with the device, and that injection. Uh, a dart, the dart uh, makes the snow leopard sleep. And once the snow leopard is asleep, they can put the collar and then they give another injection, which makes the snow leopard wake up and then it goes on its way. Um, all right, uh, Donna. Okay. Uh, I think, aren't we? Okay, then we have some time. Okay. Uh, I'll just quickly take these two, three questions. Um, because of global warming, are snow leopards migrating to warmer places? Donna, if, if at all, they might probably migrate to colder places, right? That's where they typically uh, prefer. But again, we don't know. We uh, the only movement we've seen is further in the higher reaches uh, as of now that we are aware of. Um, what kind of climate do snow leopards hunt best in? It's these mountain, uh, mountainous, um, uh, typical temperate climates. You know, if it is humid, it's it's a bit of trouble. I think the fur is so thick, they'll be they'll get overheated and not be able to survive for long. So they need cold temperatures. How do snow leopards react with humans, passive or, or aggressive? I just told you one of my personal experiences. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they, they're very unaggressive towards humans as long as they're at a safe distance or they believe they're not being threatened. Uh, would a snow leopard ever try to kill a human? Abby is wondering. There's no record where a snow leopard has killed a human ever. They have, there have been one or two instances where they have attacked humans, but that's only when a human has cornered a snow leopard and it's too afraid and it just wants to run away. So in, in trying to run away, it has ended up injuring the human. But otherwise, they don't actively hunt uh, or even attack humans. Uh, last question, finally. Lila would like to know what by what age a snow leopard starts to hunt. Now, simple answer, right? When The moment they're away from their moms, that's when they should be successful enough to be able to hunt. They start trying to hunt by themselves, maybe at a much younger age, right? Maybe about a year or even less than that. So that's how, uh, yeah, that's how, that's roughly the age when they start hunting. Okay, so I think we're done with this round of Q&A, uh, unless I have missed something, in which case, please feel free to let me know. Yeah, I think mm. that was all the questions. So <laughs> thank you again. And we're just about done. Um, we just had one announcement that we wanted to let everybody know about. Sure. So the National Biodiversity Teach-In is a student-led project. And so we have a lot of partners with us. And one of those partners is Echo Earth International. And Echo Earth International envisions a world where every individual from all backgrounds and experiences has the opportunity and tools to create a healthy and thriving environment. To, to that end, our mission is to build global youth movement to protect and restore our ocean planet. So there's going to be a challenge that they're doing. Um, it's a STEM competition for, um, from grades five through nine. 
and they will build through teams and there are a lot of different prizes that you guys can enter for and if you guys have any more questions or are interested in that you can go ahead and just email um, us and we can get you that information that's all. And then thank you for joining us. Thank you for your presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day.